Is there a God? Is there such a thing as an all-powerful, self-existent God? Mankind has searched tirelessly for centuries to try and find compelling evidence to satisfy his curiosity with his own eyes, and so come to his own conclusion that there is, in fact, an actual God. But unfortunately, man denies the clear evidence that lay before his eyes. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there is plenty of evidence that reveals the existence of an all-powerful God and creator. And we could look at the vast amount of evidence in the evidence of archaeology, which only confirms the accuracy of the Bible. But the most compelling evidence, ladies and gentlemen, lay on your laps this night, and that is the Bible, the Word of God. The Bible substantiates various archaeology evidence that ma mankind has unearthed, and so vindicating the existence of an all-powerful creator. Its origins therefore claim to be of divine authorship. The Bible is God's revelation to mankind, and within it contains the following. It contains God's revealed will, his purpose with mankind and the earth, and his purpose with his chosen people. You see, there is a God that has created all things. There is a God who cares about his creation. And there is a God who has a purpose with mankind and the earth which he inhabits. Now, this may sound like an off-the-cuff or vague statement for me to make, but we are told in the Bible, in John chapter 1, that no man hath seen God at any time. Now you might be wondering where I'm heading with that. So what this is telling us very clearly is one basic truth, and that is that it does require faith to believe in not only something that we cannot see, but faith to believe in something that we can never see in this mortal state in which we currently possess. Sure, we can see the visible things around us as far as creation is concerned, but we cannot see God. And so faith is required to believe in that which cannot be seen. Hebrews 11 and verse 1 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Consider further these quotes. In Exodus 33, this is an account where Moses stood before one of the angels of God, one of the representatives of God, and he said, God said, Thou cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. In the first of Timothy, chapter 6, speaking of God, it says, Who only hath immortality, dwelling in light which no man hath seen, nor can see. And in Hebrews 11, we are told, without faith, it is impossible to please him. That is, that is God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And Jesus, an account here where after he was raised from the dead, one of the disciples named Thomas said he would only believe if, if he saw and so the Lord's reply to Thomas was, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. But he says, Blessed are they that have not seen and have believed. There is a mountain of evidence if we are prepared to look at it through the eye of faith. Now we are told in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Great confidence, ladies and gentlemen, can be placed in the Bible. The prophecies in which it contains, great confidence can be placed in them. Because God himself is the actual author. Although many writers, they were inspired to write what God had ordained. And he, he selected those various men to speak his word and to perform his will. Now, we are told the following, 
In the second of Peter, chapter 1, here the Apostle Paul says, We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were moved by God's special power to write the things that we have in front of us today called the Holy Bible. The apostle here uses the word, he uses the little word sure at the start, up the top there in verse 19, to describe the word of God and its prophecies. They are sure. Now, the word sure here in the Greek, it gives the idea of stability, to be steadfast, and that which is firm and unmovable. It is a strong foundation. It cannot be moved. It is a sure thing. Another verse to consider is that of Isaiah chapter 55. Here God says through the prophet Isaiah, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I have sent it. So God's word is a sure thing, and what God says will come to pass. Having considered these things, ladies and gentlemen, we can be assured that what is written in the Bible is God's revealed will. There are many other quotes to prove this, but for time's sake, we only chose a few quotes to prove this. And that all things written therein are designed for mankind to give hope in a hopeless world in which we live. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to Titus, confirms that it is impossible for God to lie. So we have every reason to be confident in what God has revealed within the pages of his word. You see, the God of the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, presents himself, as you will have noticed in our reading. He presents himself as the one true God and the God of Israel. Hundreds of times throughout the pages of the Old Testament, we read the assertion, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. And consider also these quotes that support our claim. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have, I not, have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are my witnesses, speaking of Israel. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. And in the first of Kings, where we have the, the dedication of the, the temple of Solomon, it says, Solomon spoke and said, that all people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is none else. And to this, God was well pleased. Some more quotes that talk about the oneness of God. Here in the quote of John 17, verse 3, the Lord, when praying for his disciples, said, And this is life eternal, that they, the believers, might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And in Jude chapter 1, we are told, To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So we are told that he is the God of Israel through the pages of the Bible. He is the one true God and that he is the only wise God. Turn with me, if you will, <clears throat> and we'll consider the nation of Israel. Turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 3. Now, here we have the account where God appears unto Moses and reveals the work he had for Moses 
in delivering Israel out of Egypt. And in verses 1 and 2 of Exodus 3, God says, uh, it says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire outside, out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Okay, so what is being revealed to us here? We have a bush with the angel of God in the midst of it, and the bush is on fire, but it is not being consumed. So what we have revealed to us here is a prophetic pictorial of the nation of Israel's future from that point forward. Like the bush, Israel as a nation will be continually burnt but not consumed. And therefore, this prophetic pictorial that was revealed under Moses was to show the persecution that they would endure as a people. But it also depicted the overshadowing care of God with the presence of the angel in the bush's midst. And so God continued to speak to Moses and revealed his intention to him. Turn the page over to chapter, uh, verses 7 and 9. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians... Now if you will, turn with me please to Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis 15 and verses 12 to 14, now over 400 years earlier, it was revealed unto Abraham, the forefather of the Jewish people, the very things that were to take place in Egypt, that his progeny would suffer at the hands of another nation. Verses 12 and 14 of Genesis 15. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And so it was prophesied by God that Israel would be persecuted by another nation and in a land that was not theirs. The very outcome of this prophecy, ladies and gentlemen, proves the existence of God because what God had declared came to pass. And God told Moses that he would bring them out, of, bring them out into their own land. Now, this was the land that was promised to Abraham and later extended to the nation of Israel. Now turn with me back a few pages to Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis 12 and verses 1 to 3, we see, we see here the promises that God makes to Abraham and are in fact a prophecy because they have not been yet fulfilled. Read verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee... Abram, a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so upon the basis of obedience and faith, God would bestow these blessings upon Abraham and would make of him a great nation. 
make his name great throughout all the earth. And we know that that's not fulfilled because Abraham actually lies in the grave. So Abraham awaits the resurrection for that to become to its full fruition and be fulfilled. The third part says that he would bless all those who bless him and God would bring blessings unto all nations through Abraham. Now, in Genesis 13 and verses 14 to 17, God makes further promises to Abraham in Genesis 13 and verse 14 to 17. It says, And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot, his nephew, was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Now primarily the seed spoken of here is the Lord Jesus Christ, which we will see later. And he goes on and he says, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. So we can see that it becomes a multitude. And there lies the nation of Israel. And you'll, we'll see later how that extends unto others. He says, Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Now we, we know that these, these promises, ladies and gentlemen, are not yet fulfilled. Because Abraham would have to be standing in the earth today for these to be fulfilled fulfilled. Abraham's name is not great in the earth yet. If I walked down the street and asked anybody if they knew the man Abraham out of the Bible, they probably wouldn't have a clue who I was talking about. And not many people do unless you're a familiar reader of the Bible. So his name is not great in the earth, is not great in the earth yet. And his descendants, Abraham's descendants, the Jews, are not a great nation either. But we will see as we move on, how these things will come to fruition through further prophecies of the scriptures. And so we'll have a look at some prophecies concerning Israel as a nation that have been fulfilled, which yet again do vindicate the very existence of an almighty and powerful God who presents himself within the pages of the Bible as the God of Israel. He does not proclaim himself to be the God of any other nation but the nation of Israel. So moving forward many years, the Jewish people, or Israelites as they were called, began to multiply greatly in the land of Egypt and were bond slaves for approximately 210, 220 years. They were occupied in the land for a roughly 400 to 430 but you will see, if, you know, when you closely look, it was their, their, slight, their, their captivity by Egypt, as far as slavery was concerned, was around 210, 220 years. And so God had separated them from all peoples for himself. And this is how God viewed them when he brought them out of Egypt. See, God himself states very clearly the following concerning his people. He says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. In Leviticus, we read, and ye shall be holy unto me. So this is what God actually required of his people. He required that they shall be holy unto him. For I, the Lord, am holy and have severed you from other people that you or ye should be mine. And in Zechariah 8, we are told that he that toucheth you, Israel, toucheth the apple of God's eye. So it seems like a quite a strange expression, but... What is being expressed here is the apple is referred to the pupil of God's eye and that being always focused intensely on his people Israel. You see, I'm sure you'll agree, the pupil of the eye is the most tender part of the body. 
and the one that reacts immediately to any foreign matter touching it. And so we are being shown in this verse that none can touch the people of God with impunity. And we will see through the pages of history uh, that those who have gone against Israel have come to zero. Uh, they came to Mount Sinai after they came out of Egypt uh, through the hand of Moses under God's guidance and it was here that Moses was addressed by God. Now the account is found in Exodus chapter 19. In Exodus 19 and verse 3 to 6 we read the following. And Moses went up unto God and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, speaking of the house of Israel, the Israelites, and tell the children of Israel, ye, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, and here's the key point, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me, God says, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. What a glorious future, ladies and gentlemen, God had promised the nation if they obeyed him. Now it is further stated in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. God, out, God outlines further blessings from the law of Moses which would come to Israel if they actually obeyed him. It states that God would give them peace and safety, good harvests, victory over their enemies in the land and in the neighbouring lands. In fact, everything to make their lives secure and happy. But if they did not obey and serve God, then the curses of the law would come upon them. We get that in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 15. So it was God's purpose through Moses to use Israel to teach other nations his purpose, to be a good example to those neighbouring nations. In Deuteronomy 4 verses 5 to 9 we read the following. And here we are told, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me. And this is Moses addressing the, the uh, children of Israel that ye should do so in the land with ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. <clears throat> for what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? And so God says in Isaiah 43, in our reading, he says, Ye are my witnesses to the nations, to the world about them, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. The word witnesses there gives the idea of being a testimony, a testimony to the existence of God. And that's why he called them witnesses. They were to be a testimony to the very existence of Almighty God. Now, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, Israel proved to be a bad example to the nations around them, time and time again. You will see that through the history, through the pages of God's word. Now, Moses actually prophesied that this would be the case. And he also reveals who God would use to bring upon them and scatter them throughout the earth 1,500 years before its fulfilment. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 28, please. In Deuteronomy 28 and verses 62, and ye shall be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, 
because thou wouldest not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. Verse 64, And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods, false gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Now we read also who it was that God used in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 48. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness, and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the, from the far, sorry, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Verse 50. A nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favour to the young. Verse 52. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Although the Romans did not appear on the stage of history until at least 1,200 years after Moses proclaimed these words, they are clearly identified in verses 49 and 50. You see, the standard of the Roman legions was the flying eagle, and they also came from the end of the earth, which was the far end of the then known world. And they spake a language which was unknown and foreign to the Jews. And consequently, there is no other language more foreign to the structure and idiom of Hebrew than that of Latin, which was what the Romans spoke. The Romans so clearly identified in this prophecy marched against the Jews in AD 70. Here we can see a clear pictorial of the eagle and how the picture up here, how they swiftly moved into the land and besieged the Jews in AD 70, and they trusted in the banner of the eagle. There they saw strength and swiftness. So everything they had bore the mark of the high-flying eagle. Even on the Romans' defence shields, they trusted in the wings of the eagle. So we can see here that Moses' words came to pass. And it's interesting, when they besieged the city in AD 70, the Roman commander, Titus, issued strict instructions that the temple of worship that the Jews had at the time be preserved. But the, uh, the legions ignored his command and so both the temple and uh, the city were overthrown. Now, this also fulfilled a prophecy similarly predicted by the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke 21. Here the Lord Jesus Christ said, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. Now that's clearly speaking of the Jews. In verse 6 of the same chapter, it also states concerning the temple that there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And so the Jews, the natural seed of Abraham, as a result of their disobedience to God, were scattered from Jerusalem throughout all the earth. And it wasn't until the last days of the 19th century that the Zionist organisation was established. Britain took control of Palestine at the end of the First World War with the defeat of the Turks. And shortly after the war ended, the British government wrote a letter to a one uh, prominent Jew, a Lord Rothschild, de uh, declaring the support for the Jews wanting to establish Palestine as their official homeland. And this resulted in what we know today as the uh, Balfour Declaration. 
<coughs> I won't read that. You could have a read of that after if you'd like. Um, but it was basically um, approximately, out of this Balfour Declaration, approximately 40,000 Jews in number started returning to the land. The Jews um, of Europe and America were a little bit apathetic to the idea of a Jewish homeland, and even Britain began to lose interest also. And so the con concept of a Jewish homeland began to fade into the distance. But it was God's intention, ladies and gentlemen, to bring back the Jews, and so by 1939, the Second, War, Second World War had commenced, and we know what took place in the Second World War with the, uh, the rise of Hitler and the Nazis and the persecution that the Jewish people actually faced and endured. Now, further prophecy reveals the plight that they were to be faced with whilst amongst these other nations. See, Jeremiah, Jeremiah declared this. He said, Behold, I will send for many fishes, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill out of the holes of the rocks. Now, if you come back to Deuteronomy 28 and verses 65 and 66, we read the following. And among these nations, and you can just picture the plight that the Jews were faced with during this time, uh, during World War II, throughout Europe, in the ghettos, etc. Among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have none assurance of thy life. Now, there's many accounts of Jewish people that have come out of the, uh, the various Nazi Holocaust camps, but uh, if you just read the diary of Anne Frank, I'm sure, you'll, uh, I'm sure you'll get the gist of what life was like for the Jewish people throughout Europe during World War II. Do not these quotes fitly describe the conditions that the Jews faced under the persecution of the Hitler regime? When we know over six odd million Jews lost their lives. And these are just some of the examples of a long and bitter persecution in which most nations have oppressed this very tiny nation, the people of God. And so having seen a very brief history of the Jews, we might ask ourselves, it would appear, has God cast off his people forever? Well, I will say by no means, but I will prove it through scripture. Because the Apostle Paul plainly states in Romans 11 and verse 2, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. He has a promise to the forefather of the Jewish people, Abraham, and he will keep that promise. So they will not become extinct as a nation. And so <clears throat> God himself declares the impossibility of Israel ceasing as a nation. In Jeremiah 31 and verses 35, we read the following. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from, depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the fountains of the, earth, of the earth search out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. So I ask the following questions. Will the sun ever cease to give light by day? No. Will the moon and stars cease to give light in the night? No. So. The answer is, obviously, neither will Israel cease to be a nation before their God. In fact, all the punishment that God brought upon them was, it was not in nastiness. It was to discipline them and correct them. 
Jeremiah 30 and verse 11 says, For I am with thee to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, Israel, but I will correct thee in measure and not leave thee altogether unpunished. So their long going and ongoing persecution as a people was clearly depicted in the burning bush, which we saw in Exodus chapter 3. The angel of God spoke to Moses out of and declared this. Although the bush was burning, it was not being consumed. This was a sign to Moses that the, uh, of the future of Israel that the persecution they would endure. Ladies and gentlemen, there is always light at the end of the dark tunnel of history. God has not forgotten his covenant with Abraham and his seed. Psalm 105 verses 6 to 11 confirms this. It says, O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham, and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. Now, although Almighty God scattered his people to discipline them, we find that when we go back to the quote we had previously considered in Luke 21, on our overhead, if you'd like to turn to Luke 21, and we'll have a look at the rest of that verse. In Luke 21, verse 20, 24, the Lord Jesus Christ says the following, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. We've seen that on the, quote, on the uh, overhead earlier. Now, we know that that's referring to the Roman invasion of AD 70. The verse goes on, And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, and this is speaking of the Gentile domination over Jerusalem, which followed the Romans, such as the Persians, the Byzantines, the Arabs, the Crusaders, the Turks, and the British, all those that have had some influence in the land. And then there's the last bit of the verse, which says, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In 1947, the United Nations organisation voted in favour of giving the land of Palestine to both Jew and Arab and decided to partition the land between them. The British withdrew from the land in May 1948 and one day after, exactly one day after, the State of Israel was proclaimed. So <clears throat> you see this on the, uh, the newspaper there? The State of Israel was born. And what we find, the State of Israel was proclaimed and the Jews had control over the new city. By 1967, with the Six Day War, they had defeated the Arab nations who had declared war upon them, to which they were enormously outnumbered and realistically should never have had the victory. And as a result of this, the Jews recaptured the old city. Now, this was the hand of God, without a shadow of doubt. Now, these events are in partial, and I say partial fulfilment, of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason I say partial fulfilment is because there are still, there are still Gentiles in that land. We have the Muslims and the Arabs. They occupy the area of the Temple Mount. So the, 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 the land in itself is not free totally from Gentiles. Now, <clears throat> as the Lord said, um, they, as it says, as I mentioned earlier, they should never have won that war, the Six Day War. It, the odds were immensely against the Jews, but they captured the old city of David. And these words were in partial fulfilment of the Lord when he said, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And so this was the first time that Jerusalem was back into Jewish hands since AD 70. But I do stress the point, partial fulfilment, because they do not have con total control over the area.
Now it's interesting to note that a Bible student by the name of John Thomas in 1849, he stated the following. This is a very interesting uh, comment because it was written 99 years before the state of Israel was proclaimed. And he says, there is then a partial and primary restoration of Jews to the Holy Land before the manifestation or appearing of Christ in the earth, which is to serve as the nucleus or basis of future operations in the restoration of the rest of the tribes, speaking of the 12 tribes of Israel, of the rest of the tribes after he has appeared in the kingdom. The pre-eventual colonisation of Palestine will be on purely political principles and the Jewish colonists will return in unbelief of the messiahship of Jesus and of the truth as it is in him. And he says, he makes an interesting point here, they will immigrate thither as agriculturalists and traders in the hope of ultimately establishing their commonwealth, but more immediately of getting rich in silver and gold and cattle and goods by the industry at home and abroad under the efficient protection of the British power. Now, how true and accurate are these words in light of the scriptures? Jeremiah 32 says this, For thus saith the Lord, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, so will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. And fields shall be bought in this land, whereof ye say, It is desolate without man or beast. It is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Men shall buy fields for money, and subscribe evidences, and seal them, and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin, and in the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, and in the cities of the mountains, and in the cities of the valley, and in the cities of the south, for I will cause their captivity to return, saith the Lord. Now, remarkably, in 1911, the first agricultural, the first agricultural community, Jewish community, was established to recultivate the land. These events occurred 62 years after the words of John Thomas. How did he know that? No, no normal mortal man could come up with that. The only way he could know that is if he was a fervent studier of the Bible. It was revealed in the Bible. He came up with that conclusion because of his understanding of the word of God. Now we are also told in Ezekiel 36 that God, who is capable of all things, he commanded the land to prepare for the coming of Israel. It says in Ezekiel 36 in verse 8, but ye, O mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches, and ye shall uh, and yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. Now these exciting events, ladies and gentlemen, vindicate the prophecy of the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37, which once again is referring to Israel. Because prior to these events, all these events, Israel as a nation they were literally nothing but dry, dead bones. As a nation, there was no life in them. They were scattered and wandering throughout the earth. So what a modern day miracle, a sure sign of the existence of an almighty God, the Jewish people really are. They are truly, ladies and gentlemen, the evidence of the almighty hand of God in the earth. Now all these events are according to the might of God's will not by the might of Israel's arm. You could speak to a, a Jewish person today and they will tell you, most of them will tell you that the Six Day War was through their own might. It was clearly a miracle and overshadowed by God. Now, <clears throat> in his love and mercy for them, God is continuing to bring them back to the land that he promised their forefathers. And he has kept his covenant and will continue to keep that covenant. Now this is expressed in the following words. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God. He says, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the nations, whither ye went. See, they were supposed to be a good example. They were supposed to teach the nations the things of God, but they just blended in. 
And he says, God says, I will sanctify my name, which was profaned among the nations, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. <clears throat> that the nation of Israel is clearly uh, evidence, compelling evidence, that there is a God and that he is working in the earth, not only with the Jewish people, he is actually calling out, we are told from Acts 15 and verse 4, he is calling out a people for his name. Told in Isaiah 2, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house, a grand temple, shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. You see, you don't see all nations flow into Jerusalem now, do we? It's because the Jews have profaned the name of God in the midst of them. This is future. This is going to be in the near future. This will take place. And many people shall go and say, and you can see the mindset change, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, etc. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths and the law shall go forth from Jerusalem. And he, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ shall judge among the nations. He shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn more anymore. So no longer will be the stockpiling of weapons of mass destruction and war and the money pouring into it. We will see in the future, in the near future, as we believe the Lord Jesus Christ is very close to his return, we will see in the future these things come to pass. The question is, how does all this affect you? Well, remember as we went back uh, to the promises to Abraham and his seed. God said to Abraham, unto thee will I give this land and to thy seed forever. Turn with me please to Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, we read the following. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one. Now if you take your mind back, I mentioned that primarily the promise was to the Lord Jesus Christ. That the seed was speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says here, and to thy seed... or but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So here we have confirmation. And so the Apostle Paul, with his understanding of the Old Testament, is bringing our attention to Christ. In verse 26 of that same chapter, we read the following. For ye are all children by faith. I mentioned the aspect of faith at the outset of our, uh, our address. He says, ye are all children by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as of you have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And then he says, if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, how can we be Christ's? Well, <clears throat> there are requirements to being heirs of this promise. If we repent from our ways, our normal fleshly ways, that are not in harmony with the word of God, and are baptised and put on the name of Christ, and walk in faith, as we mentioned earlier, the aspect of faith, and obedience to the commandments of God, then and only then can we be Christ's and heirs according to the promise. And God invites you to be a part of the future glory that will be established in the earth when he expressed these words to Moses. In all of Israel's failings and strivings against God, Mo, uh, God ad addressed Moses and says, look, Moses, truly I live. Despite all this, what, what Israel is doing, he says, I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And that basically means he will fill the earth with a people like him, ultimately, mentally, morally, and physically. And so God desires to fill the earth with that type of people. 
a people that are like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in character, both mentally and morally. And God will reward those who are faithful with the bestowal of immortality. It's a most glorious time when, as the prophet Daniel says, that the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Now, the hope we have set before you, ladies and gentlemen, is an Israelitish hope. It is the hope of the Bible. The Apostle Paul stated whilst in prison in Rome, he says, for the hope of Israel, I am bound with these chains. It is, this hope is the hope of the gospel, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which in essence will be the total fulfilment of the promises made unto the Jewish fathers, or as simply in one statement as the Lord put it, he said salvation is of the Jews. Ladies and gentlemen, surely this tiny nation and this amazing book that you have on your laps this night, the tiny nation of Israel being ever burnt and not consumed, surely proves the existence of an all-powerful, all-wise God. We thank you for your time.